This uh, is amidst the uh, COVID crisis going on globally in New York State, in New York City, and at our hospital. And uh, but a semblance of normal is always a nice anchor. And so the idea of continuing the educational program is uh, of paramount importance, both for the purpose of education and also for the purpose of our um, mental well-being and uh, and um, and feeling of normalcy. So. This talk is really going to focus on the sort of the concept of the patient who has both a leg length discrepancy and a deformity. And this is a big part of what we do as limb deformity surgeons. Um, the classic treatment for this has always been external fixation and the ability to correct deformity and lengthen simultaneously. But with the um, uh, with the advances of the last decade uh, and the use of an internal lengthening nail, we have really changed our approach to this problem in many, many cases. And we have tried to eliminate external fixation from the picture if it is possible to do it. So the precise nail uh, came into being in the end of 2011. We started using it in 2012. And basically, it is a uh, telescopic. Uh, intramedullary nail that can be used to gradually elongate a bone after an osteotomy is done. And for this to be successful, it really hinges on a couple of things. One is uh, the mechanics of the nail, it has to be strong enough. And number two is the mechanism of distraction has to actually work, it has to be reliable. And um, so we actually did a paper on our first 24 patients where we looked at the precision of this nail meaning, you know, how reliable is it? If we think we're lengthening 10 millimeters over 10 days, is that what we're actually doing? And we published this research, and this was really a very important initial finding because what we saw is that the accuracy on the first group of patients where the leg lengthening was, a, was a, an average of 35 millimeters, we found that the, the accuracy was 96%. And 96% is, is, is fantastic. I mean, 96% is greater than the accuracy you see with external fixation. Um, it means that it's working. It means it's reliable. And this really launched a, a new era. So what I'm going to do in this talk is break it up into sort of an antegrade technique in the femur, a retrograde technique in the femur, and a tibial technique, and then sort of a bit of another. Uh, this is a nice resource on uh, the technique of antegrade lengthening uh, using the internal lengthening nail. So here's an example. Here's the patient who shows up at the doctor's office with knee pain and medial compartment arthritis. And of course, on first glance, one starts to think about osteotomy versus knee replacement versus partial knee replacement. But in fact, this patient has a leg length discrepancy and a malunion with a deformity of the femur and a leg length discrepancy of 25 millimeters. And so it's a bigger deformity and a big picture deformity. And so while this person may need treatment for his knee, he, can't, he needs to have some treatment before the knee um, to address the problem. Maybe the, maybe the other treatment is gonna help the knee. Maybe it's gonna set the stage for the treatment of the knee. But this ends up being a good example of a patient who can benefit from um, lengthening and deformity correction. You can see that the mechanical axis deviation is 25 millimeters medial, representing a varus deformity. The deformity is coming from the femur as you analyze the joint line, uh, the uh, joint orientation angles. And mechanical axis planning shows the magnitude of the deformity of about 36 degrees. When we, when we start planning for an intramedullary nail, we must use anatomic axis planning to figure out the optimal location for the osteotomy in order to correct the deformity. And then we use a technique or a calculation called this shortest nail length analysis. And that enables us to optimally plan the diameter and the length of the nail 
so that there's optimal stability at the end of the distraction. The, these techniques in general are minimal incision techniques. Uh, we try to uh, do osteotomies percutaneously. We try to put nails in percutaneously. And if possible, um, we avoid big incisions. Now, this fixator assisted nailing technique is very, very helpful to help straighten out the bone temporarily. And the concept is that you have to place the external fixation in such a way that it's out of the path of the nail. And I think you can see on this bottom image how the fixator pins are placed so that you still can put your nail in place. And so after osteotomy and after correction, in this case, a biplanar deformity, and we put external fixation in both planes, so, uh, sometimes that's not necessary, uh, we can straighten it out, and then we can pass the osteotomy with a guide wire, ream, and put in an intramedullary nail. At the end of the surgery, uh, once the nail's in place, the deformity has been corrected, we identify the location of the nail, um, excuse me, we identify the location of the magnet. The magnet is the, is the motor uh, um, of this um, uh, process, and it's the rotation of this magnet that rotates the gears and elongates the nail with an external remote control device. So in this case, you can see the femur has been straightened acutely, and um, the patient did gain some length from the acute femur uh, lengthening, the correction of deformity, and then we were able to dial in the additional amount of lengthening that was necessary to equalize the leg lengths, um, and then progressive consolidation occurs on these x-rays. Now, once this has been complete um, and the femur has been straightened, he does still have some residual varus deformity because he has uh, joint line, because he has medial compartment arthritis and he has joint line obliquity. And so now, um, while his knee pain has been improved because the mechanical axis has been improved, he does still have some knee pain. And so the decisions here were really between a partial knee replacement versus an osteotomy. And we decided to stick with a joint preservation approach. And we did a proximal tibial osteotomy opening wedge, as you can see with the planning using the PAX software. And this was a relatively simple opening wedge osteotomy medial plating, bone graft, and, um, and that straightened out his axis and alignment nicely. Next example is in the tibia, okay? So this is an example of a 25-year-old young man who had had um, a trauma and um, ended up with a short leg and a valgus deformity. Now, it's, it's interesting, he's actually had previous um, um, bone transport surgery done in England. And, um, but the upshot of the whole thing is that at this point, he still has residual leg length discrepancy and nine degrees of valgus deformity. When we do our core planning, we can see the apex of the deformity. And as we embark on our nail project, we use anatomic axis planning in order to determine the optimal location of the osteotomy. We can localize this location of the osteotomy in surgery by simply measuring and doing an intraoperative measurement. Now, I wanna introduce the concept of blocking screws for deformity correction, um, as this, in addition to fix it or assisted nailing are the two uh, really important adjuvant techniques that we're using to accomplish a, um, a satisfactory deformity correction. And the concept goes like this. If you put a nail into um, an intramedullary canal and the nail is not extremely tight within the canal at the point of the osteotomy, you're not going to effectively correct the deformity perfectly. So again, the concept, if you have, if you have a deformity that is mid-diaphyseal and the mid-diaphysis is really tight, uh, meaning you put in a 10 millimeter nail into a 10 millimeter space, then you have a chance of perfectly correcting the deformity. But in many cases, the location of the osteotomy is such 
that the nail is actually not going to entirely fill up the canal and the nail is not going to be perfectly um, um, centered in each segment unless you push it to do that. And that's what blocking screws are about. Blocking screws are about sort of guiding the nail into the optimal location to accomplish deformity correction. And it gets confusing um, when you first start doing this about wh what's the optimal location of these blocking screws. And we have come up with this guide guideline called the reverse rule of thumbs. And it, it works very, very well and it's very intuitive because you can predict by using your thumbs as you see in the picture on the left, how you would wanna um, push a deformity correction. And it turns out that, and that's a very Elizarovian thing because that's something that is used with um, olive wires, pushing wires, pulling wires, etc. But really it's a different idea and it ends up being the reverse rule of thumbs. The, the location for the blocking screws, both at the points adjacent to the osteotomy and the concavity of the deformity, and further at the ends of the nail, are always going to follow this, pat, this pattern of reverse rule of thumbs. Now, you don't necessarily need all four of these screws. And in fact, um, it's very rare that you put in all four screws. The most common are the screws that are adjacent to the osteotomy. But with time and with various examples, there are needs to put uh, um, the other screws in. But I would say the most common uh, screw is, the, is in the concavity of the deformity adjacent to the osteotomy on either one or both sides of the osteotomy. So you'll see how we're gonna apply it here. And so here's my planning for putting in the intramedullary nail and, um, at the, and making my osteotomy at the apex of the deformity. Again, I use the SNL or shortest nail length analysis to determine um, what the length of my nail is going to be. And what I'm identifying is the need for a blocking screw. My feeling is, is that the nail is not gonna fill up the canal uh, at that location. And if I don't put in a blocking screw, I'm not gonna fully correct the, um, the valgus deformity because the canal is wider than the nail at the osteotomy level. The, the width of the nail is gonna be determined or limited by this distal diaphyseal segment, which is much tighter. And so these are some intraoperative pictures. And here you can see, as predicted, the, the nail having a very important feature uh, of pushing the nail into the location that you want it and uh, enabling the full correction of the deformity. And so this is what it looks like. It doesn't get in the way of the lengthening. Um, the lengthening then proceeds, so acute deformity correction and um, gradual lengthening with the internal lengthening nail. And this is how pro the, um, um, the consolidation progresses over time. And, as, uh, and then here you can see that we have accomplished, here you can see that we have truly accomplished a satisfactory correction of deformity and equalization of leg lengths. Okay, I wanna to switch to um, distal femoral deformity. And I do want to do a little bit of a, uh, a throwback Thursday here and show you uh, an example of a case and how I would have ha handled this um, the day before the precise nail became available to me. So this, let's say this goes back um, 10 years now. And you can see this is a 17-year-old um, uh, girl who had had a post-traumatic growth arrest and a valgus um, deformity with a leg length discrepancy of 36 millimeters. And the way that we dealt with it a decade ago, state-of-the-art, was to identify the location of the deformity, which was the, uh, the femur, the distal femur, and do our mechanical axis planning to figure out the cora. And, and then we would use a monolateral external fixator, cut the bone, perform an acute correction of the deformity, um, and then lengthen. Now this was felt to be a lot um, easier for the patient than let's say a circular external fixator where you would do uh, gradual correction of the deformity and lengthening simultaneously. 
And this technique is a technique that we utilized um, quite a bit and worked really, really well for us. You can see she ended up healing quite nicely and she ended up uh, resuming and getting back to a very, very high level of physical activity. So this technique in many cases, in many ways has become of a bit of a, an historic technique at this point, but it worked really, really well. And I use it as a, um, as a springboard to show you how we might handle a very similar case now with a retrograde application of the um, magnetic internal lengthening nail. Also technique is nicely summarized in this JBJS um, essential techniques publication. So it's a good resource for those who want to dive a little deeper. So here's a um, college student who's got also same problem, had a post-traumatic growth arrest, has a leg length discrepancy of 20 millimeters and has a valgus deformity. And so we do our um, mechanical axis planning. We figure out how many degrees we want the correction to be. And uh, we plan an osteotomy approximately eight centimeters from the joint line. And this is the path that my nail is gonna go into to correct the deformity. And to accomplish that predictably, you have to use a variety of techniques. And this is where the techniques of fixator assisted nailing comes in and also blocking screws. So here's the blocking screw um, application. Now you'll notice there's a fixator pin in the back. You'll notice that I put my blocking screws because I've already planned the path of the nail that I need. I've planned my starting point and the direction of my rod in the distal segment. This has to be carefully planned preoperatively and then has to be uh, executed in a predictable way in the operating room. Fix it or assisted nailing um, as depicted here, again, ends up providing a, a nice reproducible technique uh, for this. Following the osteotomy and the acute correction of the deformity and um, temporarily stabilizing it with a simple external fixator, um, I am then ready to insert my nail in the acutely corrected um, position. We leave the operating room with the acute correction having been done. Now, again, I think you'll appreciate that without the blocking screws, um, this would have been different. Um, and the, the direction of the nail, which looks kind of natural at this point, but you can see the contrast here, how it looks, how you see I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for the medial side and how the nail is so eccentrically located in the distal segment. That's actually the key to um, correcting the deformity and this technique working. And this is what it looks like at the end of the lengthening, equalization of the leg lengths, uh, alignment matching the opposite side, and the patient is quite happy. The healing uh, works very nicely, it's very predictable. It, it follows the principles of distraction osteogenesis uh, with a gradual consolidation of the regenerate. So again, acute correction of deformity, and then followed by gradual lengthening. Um, this x-ray uh, just helps me make the point that um, when planning these cases, you see I used a short nail here because a, a longer nail would have actually required a second osteotomy, which wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense. And so you have to take into account the second bow, and it's, it's very important that you always have a full length x-ray of the bone that you're working on. This is a nice uh, schematic that illustrates the concept of a fixator assisted uh, technique. Uh, this, was, this is from a publication of a colleague of mine from Turkey, and it goes through uh, the technique very, very nicely uh, in terms of how to um, uh, place the fixator in such a way that it doesn't get in the way of the, um, of the path of the nail. Another example, this is a, a woman who has um, a similar problem, post-traumatic growth arrest, leg length discrepancy one and a half inches, same idea, right? You can see blocking screws, you can see uh, orientation of the nail in the distal segment after the execution of the osteotomy, at the end of the surgery, 
and then gradual lengthening. Regenerate bone is really, really nice. Um, so this is a way to take care of a difficult problem without any need for external fixation. Um, here's another example to illustrate um, a slightly different point. This patient has a post-traumatic malunion with varus, recurvatum, uh, and also a rotational deformity, leg length discrepancy of four centimeters. We're always trying to come up with a solution that, that provides a comprehensive treatment for the problem. The osteotomy to correct the coronal plane deformity, the planning with the intramedullary nail and the orientation and of the nail in the distal segment, <clears throat> and location of the osteotomy. Here it's gonna require some translational deformity so you have to really pick your spot in such a way that you're gonna to able to um, accomplish your goal. What was unique in this case is that in addition to the coronal and the sagittal plane deformity and the translation, there was also rotational deformity uh, that we had um, determined both clinically and also um, based on CT scan antiversion measurements that we do in a situation like this. So we, when we insert the half pens to stabilize, as I've already shown you and use for fixator assistance, here we'll actually um, insert some additional uh, rotational divergence between the pens. At the end of the correction, um, the rotational deformity or the torsional deformity in the femur is also corrected. That's the entry point. That's the um, multiple drill hole technique at the osteotomy location. That's the completion of the osteotomy and the translation. And I'm actually using my osteotome to twist the bone and translate the distal segment anteriorly. And this is after passing the guide wire and, uh, and reaming the uh, corrected bone. This is, these are pictures from the coronal plane, the insertion point distally, the osteotomy uh, location with the multiple drill hole technique. Um, in this case, I used a hand reamer to open the canal and help establish. We used one blocking screw to guide the nail. And this is at the end of passing the nail and the acute correction of the deformity. Now, this patient was not a young guy. He was in his uh, early, late 50s, early 60s. And um, um, you can see that after correcting the deformity nicely, the bone formation was a bit slow. Uh, we've definitely learned that the strategy on these cases, you know, this golden rule of one millimeter a day is, uh, is really just a guideline. And uh, in many of these cases, and especially with the internal lengthening cases, we've learned that slowing things down a bit ends up becoming a good strategy. Um, you can see this is a sort of a typical appearance of some hypertrophic regenerate noted uh, anteriorly and a little bit uh, medially, but usually with a little bit of patience um, and some good fortune, the, uh, the regenerate consolidates nicely and the patient can get back to a very active lifestyle. Um, I'd like to show you a couple of uh, complicated cases um, where we use these uh, techniques. Um, here's a woman with a large uh, varus and procurvatum deformity who has advanced knee arthritis with a large leg length discrepancy. Um, this is a extra articular deformity that really prevents just automatically putting in a knee replacement um, because you cannot effectively correct this deformity uh, without doing an osteotomy in advance. So planning for femur deformity correction, blocking screws, osteotomy, straightening out the femur, inserting the nail, lengthening to optimize or improve the leg length discrepancy um, was step one here. And once the extra articular deformity has been corrected, then um, the nail was removed and a, a knee replacement was performed to take care of the joint uh, deformity. And so by combining these two techniques, we were able to take care of this problem comprehensively. This is another uh, complex case in the sense that uh, we're involving both the femur and tibial segments. And um, 
This patient has a leg length discrepancy that is two inches, 551 millimeters. It's a case of uh, fibular hemimelia in a young adult who had never been treated as a child. And so my plan was to address both bones, the femur and the tibia, since the leg length discrepancy was actually split between the two bones. But the femur doesn't have any deformity, but the tibia has a valgus deformity as well. So here's the plan. I'm gonna lengthen the femur um, by one inch, and I'm gonna lengthen the tibia by one inch, but I also need to correct this valgus deformity. I locate my cora or apex of deformity, and that's my location of my osteotomy. Blocking screw was used at the, uh, in the concavity of the deformity as described. Uh, tibiofibular uh, screws called fibula length stabilization screws are uh, critical when you're doing leg lengthening of a tibia and fibula. It's very important in all cases, and the idea is to prevent proximal migration of the fibula. This is fibular hemimelia case. You can already see that the, the fibula already starts in an abnormal position, and it would be very, very um, detrimental to the ankle and the overall foot and ankle alignment and function if the fibula were to, were to more proximally migrate. So floss screws, FLSS, fibula lens stabilization screws, are critical for this. So this is the end result, half the lengthening in the femur, half the lengthening in the tibia, and correction of the deformity. He progressed very nicely, consolidating the femur as expected and consolidating the tibia as expected. Now, when you lengthen the femur and the tibia, you really have to pay attention to your rate um, because while you're thinking about each bone and how much the bone can handle the, the, the rate and rhythm of the distraction, you also want to think about the entire limb. You want to think about the muscle envelope. You want to think about the nerves that, that uh, traverse the entire lower limb. So <clears throat> um, slow is better. And so an example in a case like this is even though this uh, young man was only in his 20s, what I did is I did three quarters of a millimeter a day in the femur and a half a millimeter a day in the tibia. So those combined are actually 1.25 millimeters a day. And so that's putting a decent amount of stress on the nerves. You have to keep, you have to keep that in mind and, uh, and, and watch this and adjust the rate accordingly. Uh, here's another example of a, a similar case. And I just wanted to illustrate some of the new planning techniques that are available on PACS that have been really, really helpful. Um, this feature allows you to plan the osteotomy um, and look at what the overall um, axis of the entire lower limb is gonna look like. And then this feature, um, which is the reposition tool, allows you to do the osteotomy, reposition the bone, insert your, blo your blocking screws, and see exactly how your nail is gonna fit. It also allows you to see what the joint orientation angle is gonna be, because as you're tweaking the reposition tool, the angle will change. Same thing in the tibia. And so you can see here, we're going in with the idea of the LDFA being 86 degrees and the MPTA being 86 degrees. So you get to look at the original, you get to look at sort of the big picture planning, and then you dive into each bone with its joint orientation angles. So this is a really, really nice uh, advance in, in planning that we have. Um, there are situations where we'll do bifocal treatment, and that's illustrated here. I'm gonna show you the last two examples of bifocal treatment. This is a, um, an adult patient who had a hip fracture and ended up with a, a malunion. It's not immediately apparent until you really look at it, but you can see the neck shaft angle is 113 degrees on the left compared to the right. The patient had leg length discrepancy and had weakness of his hip and uh, was really having a difficult time getting back to uh, running and high level activities that he was accustomed to. So the problem here is two. Number one is the hip malunion and the varus of the hip that we wanna correct. And the second is the length discrepancy of one inch. And so 
the, my approach here was a bifocal approach, right? I showed you before where we lengthen and correct the deformity through a single osteotomy. Here, I felt that the approach was gonna be best to do two separate levels of correction. And so I did a osteotomy of the proximal femur uh, to correct the valgus, and this is blade, 95 degree blade, blade planning, um, to correct the varus of the hip. And then my plan is to do a retrograde femur lengthening with an internal nail to deal with the leg length discrepancy. So bifocal treatment. If it were an external fixator, you'd have a big X fix with two levels. And here we have infix also with two levels. And you can see things are progressing. We've corrected the position of the hip. We've equalized the leg lengths by lengthening distally and the patient ended up having a very, very nice uh, outcome, achieving both the goals of correcting the malunion and correcting the leg length discrepancy. And I'll leave you with a final case um, that again illustrates this concept of um, bifocal treatment um, to deal with deformity and leg length discrepancy with a bit of a twist, and this is the idea of combining lengthening uh, with a hip replacement in cases of leg length discrepancy. And so here's an example of how this might be applied. This is a 28-year-old uh, female who has a high hip dislocation and uh, leg length discrepancy of about six centimeters. And so there are really two problems here. Problem number one is that there is a dysplastic hip with a dislocation, pain, difficulty walking. Um, number two problem is that there's a leg length discrepancy. And number three problem is, uh, is you can already see that there's a valgus deformity of the left lower limb. And so in a case like this with a, hip, with a high hip dislocation, step one is gonna be to do the best hip replacement that you can do. Uh, with such a, um, with so much proximal migration, um, we anticipated that this was going to require a femoral shortening osteotomy during the hip replacement to be able to do this safely. This is the planning that goes into it, and this was the execution. And so the patient ended up having a uh, hip replacement and a simultaneous uh, femoral shortening um, of 4.5 centimeters to be able to safely reduce the hip. Now, once this is done, step two is then to analyze the leg length discrepancy and the, the alignment. And you can see that the patient is left as anticipated with a, um, a leg length discrepancy of about one and a half inches and also a valgus deformity. A lot of these patients have uh, valgus alignment of their femurs. And so the idea here again was a retrograde femur. So this is a bifocal technique. And you can see this is the planning tool where we can do the osteotomy and we can um, predict what the joint orientation angle is gonna be like. We can predict the entry point, the orientation of the nail in the distal segment, we can predict where to put the blocking screws. And then in surgery, we want to repeat our, we want to execute what we've planned. And we were able to accomplish that. This is then gradually lengthened with the internal lengthening nail. The remote control device spins the magnet. The telescopic nail elongates, new bone grows in the defect. And we do that until we have equalized the leg lengths. and she consolidated very nicely. So in summary, um, this approach of acute correction and lengthening with a motorized intramedullary nail is really a, um, an evolution uh, in the process of, of our ability to correct patients' deformities and leg length discrepancies. The big advantage of this technique is that it avoids the need for an external fixator. External fixators, um, are wonderful and they're horrible both at the same time. I mean, there are problems with X-Fix. Um, they're uncomfortable for patients. They, tish, they uh, tether soft tissues. They lead to pin site irritation and infections and so on and so forth. So the idea of being able to accomplish this with internal 
fixation completely is is very very um, tempting. The it has to work, and so the principles to make it work are you need to use fixed or assisted nailing, and the entry point is critical. The direction of the nail and the short fragment is critical. External fixation pins have to be placed out of the path of the nail, and in general, uh, although there are exceptions, in general you want to do your osteotomy first. You want to realign the bone, and then you want to ream a straight bone and then nail. Blocking screws are another critical uh, adjuvant technique to make this thing work. And for the most part, again, the, uh, the blocking screws should be placed before the osteotomy and the reaming. Now, again, these are guidelines. They're not 100%. Sometimes you'll put blocking screws after. Sometimes you will ream the bone before you do the osteotomy. But in general, when you're dealing with a, <clears throat> a bone that has a deformity <clears throat> and a length discrepancy, this is, a, this is the um, uh, um, outline of how I would approach um, a case like this. So I thank you for your attention. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about these techniques, I think a good place to start would be some of those um, articles that I um, uh, posted. And, um, and for the residents and fellows that are not part of our service, you're always welcome to come into our OR. Uh, you're always welcome to uh, schedule an elective with us if you're interested in this um, and always interested in, uh, in going over a case should you need it. For the residents and for the fellows on my service, um, shout out to you. Always nice seeing you. I've missed you. Miss seeing you on a daily basis during this uh, COVID crisis, but I am confident, optimistic that we will be back to our normal. It's just going to take some time. We should all be um, uh, hopeful and forward thinking in that regard. Stay safe, stay strong, and stay optimistic. Thank you.